All right, well, welcome once again to Grace Bible Church. It is my joy to be here before you this morning. We are going to be in the book of Revelation. Sorry, let's try Zechariah. (laughs) We were in the book of Revelation. We are in Zechariah. We're going to be in chapter 2 today. We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And what we're looking at again is this is God's plan to take Israel. Israel from the return from exile all the way to King Jesus, millennial reign in his millennial kingdom. We looked last week at the first two visions. The first vision was the vision of a horse. And it was helping us understand that Messiah Jesus is ready to come and establish his reign on this earth. We also looked at a vision of four horns indicating that God will avenge himself on the nations. We have two things available for you online here. What we have is the outline of our message this morning, but we also have a cross-reference sheet for you. I've had a number of people share with me that it would be very helpful if they had for themselves a list of all the references that I make outside of the book of Zechariah. So what I did was I put together uh, a sheet that has in this sermon all the messages or all the references and the passages uh, outside of the book with a little bit of text and how they correlate to uh, the passage that we're going to be in. So you can find both of those online at the church website. I encourage you to take a look at those. Have you ever wondered what is so special about the millennial kingdom? And have you ever despaired over your own sin? The answer to those questions for me are yes and yes. Today, we're going to be looking at two visions. We're going to be looking at a vision of a man with a measuring rod. And we're going to be looking at a vision of Joshua, the high priest. And these are very, very helpful for us because we are going to see spectacular details about Christ and his rule here on earth. And that through Christ, God has provided us cleansing from our sin. So first, we're going to take a look at vision three, and this is the man with the measuring rod. What we're going to do is we're going to look at verses one through 13 of chapter two. This is a vision that is all about the restoration of Jerusalem and the promised land. We want to ask ourselves, why is this land so important? Well, it deals with God's covenant that he made with Abraham 1400 years earlier. And in Genesis chapter 17, God promises Abraham, I will give to you and your seed after you all the land of Canaan. I will give it to you for an everlasting possession. God's purpose has always had the Gentiles in view, though. He's promised this land to his people, but he has the Gentiles in view. In Isaiah 49, God says about Jesus, he says in Isaiah 49, 6, he says, I will give you as a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So God has in mind The Jew living in the land, Christ himself as a light, the Jews following Christ as a light, so his name may reach to the ends of the earth. Our first vision today shows that God's plan is to restore Israel to the land so that Israel actually could be that light to the nations. The problem was during this time and during Zechariah's time, the land of Israel was in ruin and the land was occupied by pagan Gentiles. So let's read verses uh, 1 and 2 together and see how it begins that God is going to solve this problem. This is a restored homeland. Zechariah says, Then I lifted up my eyes and I saw, and behold, there was a man with a measuring cord in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. And again, at the very beginning of this vision, we see the reference to the word then. Then I lifted up my eyes. All eight of these visions start this way. What this helps us understand is that Zechariah saw all eight of these visions in close proximity to one another, probably all in the same night. So there's a continuity of these visions that's moving as Zechariah sees these. He sees a man. There's not really much of a description about the man himself, except that he's carrying a measuring cord in his hand. And measuring cords were very significant in Israel, uh, particularly among those who had a task to measure among priests. In Ezekiel 40 through 48, we have a description of the millennial kingdom. It starts with a description of the temple and then Jerusalem and then the land. And Ezekiel is watching this and he sees a vision of a man who has a measuring cord in his hand. And he is measuring the dimensions of the new temple and the the dimensions of Jerusalem and then the land. It's very important that he understands that this is for the purpose of measuring. Uh, If you want to jot down a few verses, you can jot down Ezekiel 40, verse 5, verse 20, and verse 32. These are examples of different measurements that are made on 
the temple that is in Jerusalem. The rest of chapters 41 through 48 deal with the measurements of Jerusalem and the land itself. And Zechariah was aware of all of these things. Ezekiel wrote during the time of the exile and Zechariah was a priest just after that time. So Zechariah was very familiar with the idea of a measuring rod. He's aware of all of these things, but he still asks the question. He asks the question, but notice that he doesn't ask the angel. The interpreting angel is with him throughout the whole series of visions, but he doesn't actually ask the angel. He asks the man himself who's carrying the measuring rod. Beginning of verse two. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem. He's going to measure its dimensions as to its width and its length. Here, what Zechariah sees, he sees a man who's doing the very, very same thing that what Ezekiel saw earlier on, about 60 years earlier. The man is going to measure Jerusalem. He's not measuring it to see the current status. He doesn't have the current status of Jerusalem in view. What he has is a foretelling here of the future status. God is saying, I have a plan for the new Jerusalem. It's the same plan that I spoke through Ezekiel. That same plan is still intact. So the first thing that Zechariah needs to understand is that everything that God had promised about the measurements of this new millennial kingdom that he promised to Ezekiel about 60 years earlier is still going to come to pass. Let's keep reading verses 3 through 5. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out. So the interpreting angel is going out. And another angel was coming out to meet him and said to him, Run, speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. Indeed, I, declares Yahweh, I will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be glory in her midst. So the angel is going out. He's been at Zechariah's side all along the time here. But he goes out, he goes away, and he begins to depart from Zechariah. And a second angel appears. So these are two separate angels that are on, in view here. And what's clear is that the second angel is speaking to the first angel, the interpreting angel. And he has a message for that young man. He's speaking to the first angel and he's saying, explain to Zechariah. But before we look at the message, we need to understand who it is that this angel is going to be quoting. And we can see that he's going to be quoting God himself Starting with the word Jerusalem in verse 4, all the way through to the end of verse 5, these are God's words. These are God's words that are God's message to Zechariah. And the message is, run. Run and tell Zechariah an urgent, urgent message. This is imperative. He needs to understand this. And we see what the message is at the beginning of verse 4. The message is, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls. The emphasis here really is on the, the fact that Jerusalem won't have any walls in the millennial kingdom. It's important for us to remember once again what was the significance of walls in any city of any size. They were built for purposes of protection. You think about Jericho during the time of the conquest, and there were walls around the city that protected the city. They were part of the city. Jerusalem itself had walls. And those walls were the subject of a siege any time a, a nation would come around them like the Assyrians. A city without walls was a city that was an easy target for the enemy. So why no walls? If we keep reading, we find out why there will be no walls to protect this city in the millennial kingdom. And in verse 4, as we read a little farther, we find out it's because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. There will be so many men. God's plan was to redeem a multitude of Jews from all over the world at a time very far in history from where Zechariah is now. And these Jews will return to the promised land from all of the nations. In chapter 10, let's turn there and we can see in verse 9 something that God has in view here. As we skip ahead, we'll find out exactly what he has in mind with these people. God is speaking about how he will disperse the Jewish people and then how he will call them back. He says, I will sow them among the peoples. So he will disperse them and send them out from their land because of their obedience, uh, disobedience. But then he says, and they will remember me in far countries, and they with their children will live and turn back. So all of these people that have been dispersed, that are reproducing, that are duplicating, many, many Jews, they will remember him and they will turn back. And this is a foretelling of millennial Jerusalem. 
It's in Zechariah's day when he's hearing this, and so he thinks about where, where the Jews have been dispersed to. They've been dispersed to Babylon here most recently, and, and before that they were dispersed to Assyria. But today, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, have been dispersed to many, many places, and there are many, many more of them. They will return. The idea is that so many Jews will return that, that the people would overrun any of the walls that would be built around a city. It just wouldn't be possible to contain all of the people who are going to come back in a city that has traditional walls around it. But notice also that there are cattle within the city. This is unusual. This is extremely unusual. Normally, the cattle were kept outside of the city. And the reason why they were kept outside of the city is because you wanted to build a wall to protect everything that's within the city. And the most important thing was the people. So all the people stayed inside the city. They put the wall around the city and everything else was outside. Well, here, there's no wall, and the cattle are in and among the people. They're all throughout the city because of what we see in verse 5. There's no more danger there, and the reason why is that I, declares Yahweh, I will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. So we want to observe two things here that, that are really helpful to us to understand about this. First is that their security is in Yahweh himself and that God will be among them and he will be their glory in their midst. Seventy years earlier, God's glory departed from the temple during the time of Ezekiel because Israel was so sinful. Here God is saying to you, I will return and you will experience my glory. We remember from our our time last week that when the, the first wave of returnees came, and there were other waves to come later, but the first wave returned, and there were only 42,000 people who came. But most of Judah was back in Babylon. They were back in Babylon, and they were there with all of its godlessness. They were probably born in Babylon. They were raised there. That was their norm. That's what they understood. And if Jerusalem is going to be a place of Christ's reign, and it's going to be a place without walls, and it's going to be a place full of God's blessing, full of God's presence, then what about all of the Jews who are not yet returned? And that's what we see as being addressed in the second section of this vision, that is in verses 6 through 9, and that is a forsaken worldliness. God is saying, I have prepared this wonderful place. I'm going to be dwelling amongst you. You will have my presence. You will have all of these blessings. But there is something that you must do, and that is that you must forsake worldliness. And so God continues speaking. And now he moves his attention from future Jerusalem, way out in the future during the millennial kingdom. And he puts his focus right here, right now on Zechariah's day. And he starts speaking to the Jews who were still in Babylon during the time of Zechariah. Again, they were living there. They were happy with their life. They didn't know anything else. It was their pleasure to be there. They had never really participated in any true kind of worship because they didn't have a temple. Their priests weren't functioning. They had no great desire to return. Let's read verses 6 and 7 and see what is said. God says, Ho there, free from the land of the north, declares Yahweh. For I have dispersed you as the four winds of heaven, declares Yahweh. Woe, Zion, escape. You who are living with the daughter of Babylon. God uses an expression here to grab the attention of the people in Babylon that he wants to hear his message. And the message is, ho there. And this is not a way of saying, yo, there. This actually is the Hebrew way of saying, woe is coming. So when you see ho there, that means woe is on its way. And God is reminding Judah, I scattered you because of your sin. But you need to remember my plan. It's a plan that we mentioned last time, Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, I know the plans that I have for you. And these plans involve peace and a future and a hope. But that future hope, that future peace is all tied to those people returning to Jerusalem. And God is saying, woe is coming to you if you remain where you are. Verse 7, woe Zion, escape you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. So what is implied here is when they are living with the daughter of Babylon, those who are in Babylon, God is speaking of a specific place. He's speaking of that place that they were exiled to. 
Uh, they're immersing themselves in it. They're embracing the lifestyle. They're living according to the ways that the people who already were there are living. And God is saying through Cyrus and his decree, I have given you the opportunity to return. So escape from there, return. I have given you this opportunity. And the reason why is in verse eight. And what we want to do here is we want to notice the change in who is speaking. In verse five, you have Yahweh speaking, but you'll notice in verse eight, that Yahweh of hosts is now speaking, Messiah himself. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, after glory, he has sent me against the nations which have taken you as spoil, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now Christ himself, we want to understand and see in all of this, is the agent of God's wrath against Babylon. And God's plan for Babylon was, again, that they would receive and they would take Israel away into exile to be there. And they would actually serve God's purposes for the people of Israel. They would hold them in captivity. And God's plan again was for 70 years of them holding them in captivity. And then through Cyrus and the decree of Cyrus, the people would be permitted to return. But they went way beyond what God had intended for them to do. And they had abused the people. In verse 15 of chapter one, if you look back, what they had actually done was they had actually increased the calamity that God brought upon the people. So God had the perfect amount of discipline for them, and they added to that. What he's saying here is, he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. We think about our eyes, and the eye is the most sensitive part of the human body. And any touching of it by anybody else is a great offense to us. And so the Babylonians' greatest offense when they abused Judah was actually against God himself. Now, we know that, that God had favor and he had love for Israel. and He had a particular love and affection for them. They were his people. But Zechariah's emphasis here and his point is that Babylon's mistreatment of the people of Israel was actually an offense against God himself. And in verse 9, we see Messiah Jesus' response to that offense. Messiah speaks and he says, Behold, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be spoiled for their slaves. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me. That's how you know that Jesus Christ is the speaker here because Yahweh of hosts has sent him. The last verse shows us that the part that Israel will have in carrying out God's wrath against the nations. And you see more of that in, in chapter 14 when we get there. But Babylon's offense is so personal against God that their riches will be given as booty and as spoil to God's people. And this will be the sign that Jesus truly is the Messiah. This is the sign for them to understand, the people of Israel to understand. This is one way that God is showing them that you are my people. You will take their spoil. So if Jerusalem will be full of God's blessing and Messiah Jesus will be the agent of God's wrath against Babylon, then what will be the result of all of this, especially in Jerusalem? And the answer is worship, a unified worship. And what we'll find is that it's not only a worship of the Jewish people worshiping Christ, but it's a worship of all people, all people worshiping Christ. So let's read, starting in verse 10. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion. So God gives Judah of Zechariah's day a command, sing. But notice who's being addressed, daughter of Zion. He's speaking to the ones who return to Zion the ones who return to the promised land, who return to Jerusalem. He's not speaking of those who have continued to embrace the life in Babylon and won't return. He says, sing for joy. And this expression, sing for joy in the Hebrew is one word. They have one word for this. It's a, a very loud, exuberant shouting with gladness and joy. And so God is saying, shout with joy. Just burst forth with joy in your singing. Be glad, have a feeling of happiness and joy in all of this. And they're to explode with joy because of two reasons. And we see this as we think back to verse five. It's very helpful for us to think back in verse five, where God says, I will be the glory in their midst. That's our setting. That's what we need to remember. Here, God will actually dwell with them as we look at verse 10. God says, behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares Yahweh. And many nations will join themselves to Yahweh in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. 
This is where Israel will finally begin to fulfill the role that God has for them, that he had for them all along in being a light to the nations. We see the result of that is that many nations are joining themselves to God. And to join is to be bound together in a relationship. That is what the nations will be doing. And when God says they will become my people, he's not saying they will become ethnic Israel. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is they will enter into a saving relationship with me. So you'll have his people, the people of Israel, but you'll have at the same time gathered and joined together in relationship with them, people from all nations and places in a saving relationship with God. And this is how Judah will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. This is how they will know, because not only will they take the spoil of those in Babylon, but another way they will know is that God is using them to draw the Gentiles to him. And at the end of verse 9, God used the Jews' plunder of Babylon and Assyria to show that he had sent the Messiah. But here again, just remember and see that, that God goes a step further. And he says, I will actually use the uniting of the Gentile and the Jew in their worship of me to prove to you Jews that Jesus Christ, the Jesus, is the Messiah. And Christ continues speaking in verse 12. And what we see here is that there is something else that's taking place. And there's an inheritance that is taking place. And this is really sweet and really precious. Then Yahweh will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Two things are in view here. One is that Christ is inheriting Judah. And then you see God's choice of them at the same time. Let's just step back and think for a minute and ask ourselves whether inheriting and choosing of God's people sounds familiar to us. Listen to Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. We know these verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to the saints in Ephesus a mixture of Jew and Gentile, but primarily a Gentile audience. God chose us. God chose the Gentiles as well. Further on in the same chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Paul is praying. He's praying for the people in the church in Ephesus, but by extension, he's praying for all believers that they would do something very important, that they would know three things. And the second of these is the most important of these for us as it relates to where we are in Zechariah today. Paul starts by praying that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened so that they would know three things. And the second of which is what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? That Christ actually has an inheritance in the saints. The Gentile saints who are permeating throughout all of the world, following him, worshiping, loving him, obeying him, taking his word to the nations. They are his inheritance in the saints. So that relates back to what we see in verse 12 of Zechariah 2, where God says, Yahweh himself will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. The very same thing that happened for the Gentile, God then advances and bestows upon the Jew. They become his inheritance and they are his choice. So the Jews are added to the inheritance. But then Christ has one more thing to say about that in this vision in verse 13. And it has to do with awe and reverence. He says, be silent all flesh before Yahweh, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. So this is an address that's not just given to the Jew. Now we are hearing something that is being addressed to all flesh, all of mankind. And all of mankind is to adopt a sobriety. There is joy for the redeemed. There's exuberant joy that's demanded, that's needed, that's appropriate and required. But the end of the matter in all of this is a reverence and an awe over Jesus as Messiah. So as you step back and look at all of this, you have this wonderful place where God is going to dwell among his people. You have all of this inheritance that he has. You have God's choice of them. But at the end of the matter, you step back and you look back and the response of every one of us, not just us, but all flesh, is to stand in awe of who Jesus Christ is. So I have one point of application for us as we think about this. And and the application comes from kind of the middle of this vision as uh, we think about the command it was to return from Babylon, to flee from Babylon. 
The application for us is think back to your life before Christ and all of the things that had your heart, all of the things that held your affections, all of the things on which you expended your energy and your thoughts. Are any of those things still in your life? Are they still things that you maintain a fondness for and an affection for? God is asking you, God is commanding us, God is telling us, leave the worldliness behind so that it makes clear to the world around us that God has changed us. We love the things of God. So examine whether you have any fondness for the things that were in your life before Christ. We're going to go on to the second vision here, which is of Joshua and the high priest. This makes so much sense for us because if Messiah Jesus is going to dwell among his people in the millennial kingdom, we need to know what this Messiah is really like. And that's what visions four and five are all about. Vision four helps us understand this through the perspective of Joshua, the high priest. And in your outline, this should be verses one through five, not verses one through three. But we're going to read verses one through three to get started. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And Yahweh said to Satan, Yahweh rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, Yahweh, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand delivered from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and standing before the angel. Again, the interpreting angel is right there. He's with Zechariah and Zechariah sees Joshua. So it's important that we understand who Joshua is. This is not Joshua, the son of Nun, who took the promised land. This is Joshua, the high priest. Let's turn to Ezra chapter five, verse two. What we're going to see here is exactly who he is. Ezra 5, verse 2. Uh, before we uh, look at that verse, we need to remember what this passage is telling us about him. Joshua is the high priest. Uh, Joshua was a real person, and he was a high priest. We'll see a little bit more detail about him and who he was. Ezra chapter 5, verse 2. Then Zerubbabel and Joshua, or Yeshua, began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So Joshua was contemporary with Zechariah. He and Zerubbabel were the ones who actually led the effort to begin rebuilding at the same time that Zechariah was there. Zechariah and Haggai were the prophets who came beside the people and encouraged them and exhorted them to begin the work. And Joshua and Zerubbabel were the ones who were actually leading the work. Now, the role of the priest was to mediate the relationship between a holy God and sinful Israel. And the way they did that was with sacrifices. And it's really important that we understand that there was no means of a relationship with God apart from the priest. The priest officiated the sacrifices that covered Israel's sin and temporarily appeased God's wrath. So without this high priest, it was very, very difficult. It was not possible to have a right relationship with God. And we notice what we we see here in in verse 1 of chapter 3 is that Joshua is representing Israel before God and Satan is there accusing him. He's there to accuse the high priest. And to accuse is to lay forth a charge. And there's a hostility associated with that charge. It's not just a, a lame, empty, vain accusation. There is hostility in this, and it's a valid charge. But his charge is that Joshua, and by extension, all of Israel, is unworthy of God's favor. And we can jump ahead to verse 3, and we see why it is that Satan is making that claim. He makes that claim because Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Satan is saying, this priest and all the people that he represents are sinful. And on the basis of that sinfulness, they are unworthy of your favor. But we notice the response of Messiah in verse 2. Yahweh says to Satan, Yahweh rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, Yahweh who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Now, it's very important that we keep our Yahwehs straight here. Yahweh said at the beginning, this is Messiah Jesus speaking. So Messiah is speaking and he says, Yahweh rebuke you. At first glance, it appears that Christ is invoking his own authority. 
But when we look closer, we see who the second mention of Yahweh really is. And that becomes clear when we see that that Yahweh, the second Yahweh that's being mentioned there, is the one who has chosen Jerusalem. That's the Father. So he's saying, the Father rebuke you. The Father who has chosen rebuke you. So what we see here is a, is a picture of authority. The Father has all authority. And in that authority, he has chosen Jerusalem to be reconciled to himself. And Jesus is speaking directly to Satan, but he is making an appeal to the Father. This is a priestly appeal to the Father. He's petitioning the Father on behalf of his people to extend his favor to those ones that he has chosen. We ask ourselves again, stepping back, does this sound familiar to us? Does the idea of the great high priest petitioning the Father sound familiar to us? Romans 8 is a great place for us to go. Verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. And here it is for us, who also intercedes for us. So in Romans 8, we have Christ interceding for us, the recipients of the letter to the church in Rome, the Romans, Jews and Gentiles, and by extension, all Gentiles. Christ is interceding for all of them. These are the ones that just a few verses earlier, we know that, that God foreknew and he predestined and he called and he justified. Christ is interceding on their behalf. Here in our context, Christ is interceding for the Jew, the Jew of Jerusalem that God has chosen. And moreover, we see who this people is. This is a people who is a brand delivered from the fire. This helps us understand God's view for saving these people. It's speaking of a context that's coming at the end of this age. Jesus is informing Satan that God's ultimate judgment of the world will come in a fiery inferno and that the people of Israel will be spared from this. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the very end of the letter. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be found out. So the final destruction of the earth is coming with burning and with fire. I think we know that. And Christ is saying to Satan here, by his sovereign will, the Father has chosen to spare and snatch from that inferno a group of people from Israel. And his choice overrides any of your claims of their unworthiness. So that's what Christ is saying. That's what Messiah is saying. Keep reading in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 3. And he answered and spoke to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said, See, I have made your, iniqu your iniquity pass away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said to them, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of Yahweh was standing by. So God has chosen the people of Israel. God has chosen specific people of Israel for salvation. But the problem is Joshua is still sinful. His clothes are dirty. And the Hebrew word for filthy here is very, very direct. It's the word for human waste. It's very offensive. It's foul. It's repulsive and repugnant. And that is what is on Joshua's clothing. And this is a really big problem for them because in his role as mediator, the priest is supposed to be pure. He needed to purify himself first before he could offer for sacrifices on behalf of the people. And so God cannot fulfill his promises to his people without those people being completely holy. And here Joshua is standing there with dirty garments. And here's where you see the divine solution to the human sin problem, regardless of what nation you're from, but it's for the Jews. There were those who were standing before him, probably more angels that are standing there in the presence of God in this, this holy scene. Messiah Jesus commands them to remove the filthy garments from Joshua. He doesn't say wash the garments. He says, remove them. Take what is on him and get rid of it. Remove it from consideration, blot it out as if it weren't there. And then he says, give him new robes, give him festal robes. Those are robes that are appropriate for feasts. And what's in view here is the feast that Messiah Jesus will enjoy with his people in his millennial kingdom. 
David speaks of this in Psalm 23 when he says, you have prepared for me a table in the presence of my enemies. There is a, a table, there is a feast, there is a supper that is coming that all people who are Christ will enjoy with him in his kingdom. So with that knowledge, Zechariah describes something in verse 5. He says, let them put a clean turban on his head. What is most appropriate for a priest who has been forgiven, who is looking forward to the millennial reign with Jesus, is to assume the role of priest here today. Live out your role today. Zechariah is saying he has been properly consecrated and he is now ready to serve us. All of his dirty clothes have been taken off. He has been given clean garments, festal garments, and he is ready to serve us. So what we're going to look at now is a priestly privilege that comes to those priests who are faithful. And we see that in verses 6 and 7. This is really, really sweet because here is where we see that God has something in store for the faithful priest. And it's good for us to remember just in the back of our mind that not all of the priests in Israel's history were faithful. Many, many of them were derelict in their duty as priests. But this is God's charge for them. The angel of Yahweh testified to Joshua saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, if you will keep the responsibility given by me, then you will render justice in my house and also keep my courts. And I will grant you access to walk among those who are standing here. So now what we see is a, a very present requirement for the priest. And what comes with that present requirement, if you are faithful to that requirement, is future privilege. And that privilege will come in three parts. But first, let's look at the requirements. There are two of them. The first is if you walk in my ways. To walk in my ways means that the priest needs to be an example to all of the people. He's the one who knows the law most completely and most thoroughly. He knows how to live rightly before God more than all of the people because he has studied the scriptures. He is, his charge and his command is to live that out. But also he needs to keep the responsibilities given by God to him. What this relates to is the discharging of his office as priest. He needs to be faithful in the task that God gave him as a priest. Throughout Israel's history, their history was full of priests who were not faithful. They were derelict. They were negligent in their task and their responsibilities that God gave them. They were essential responsibilities. So those are the requirements. You need to walk in my ways and you need to discharge your duties faithfully. And we see the privileges that come for those. God says, you will render justice in my house. What he's talking about here is giving priestly counsel from his temple in the millennial kingdom. Ezekiel 44 is a really good example of this. It helps us see with clarity that the priests in the millennial kingdom are actually serving a purpose where they are rendering counsel and they're rendering judgment to the nations and to the people. Let me read chapter 44, verse 24. And what we'll see here as we look at this is the role that the, the priest will play in dispensing the law and the use of the law and applying it to the circumstances that are in view at the time. Again, this is with the millennial kingdom in view. And in a dispute, they shall take their stand to judge, and they shall judge it according to my statutes and my judgments. It will be the privilege of the priest to dispense God's truth in resolving issues in the millennial kingdom. And he also says the second privilege, you will also keep my courts. This doesn't mean that the, the priest is the housekeeper and he's sweeping the floor in the courts. The priest has a, a much more high, lofty purpose here. And what that is, is to maintain the purity of the temple court. And this is in contrast to the way that the derelict priests let all kinds of garbage enter into the courts in Israel's day. The wicked priests were, were open to allowing any kind of practice, any kind of person in their courts. This was the place where God intended. It was right next to the place where God was dwelling and he intended holiness and rightness of life to be on place there. But the priest who has been faithful to discharge his duties here on the earth will have the privilege of maintaining holiness in God's courts in the millennial kingdom. But then we also see the third privilege and that relates to access. And we see that in verse seven. I will grant you access to walk among these who are standing here. 
And so what he's talking about there is a context in which the vision is taking place. The priest will have access to walk among those people. So if the man was faithful in discharging his, his duties as a priest here in this life, he will have access to Christ in the millennial kingdom. He will same, have the same access to the presence of God as those angels themselves. We think that that might be something that's unique and specific to the priest, but what we want to know is that we actually have unique access to Christ himself today. I want to read a few verses from Ephesians chapter 3 that help us understand that Christ actually is dwelling within us and we have access to him in a very intimate way today. This is Ephesians 3 verses 16 and 17. Again, Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus and he's praying things for them. And what he prays is that God would give them according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you being firmly rooted and grounded in love, and he goes on to describe other benefits as well. What we see here is that Christ actually dwells in the heart of the person who has faith. Sometimes we think that the only member of the Godhead who's dwelling within us is the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to undersell that at all. This is a wonderful privilege. The Holy Spirit that regenerated us remains in us from the day of regeneration, convicts us, encourages us, counsels us. But what Christ is saying here is, I dwell in the, what we're learning here is that Christ dwells in the, the hearts of all of those who possess faith. So it's very important for us to understand that we, we examine ourselves and remember that Christ actually dwells within the believer. So the, the Old Testament priest who was faithful, he has access to Christ to look forward to. Every believer has that very same access today. And that access will be greatly enhanced and it will be grown and it will be magnified and amplified when we actually see Christ in person. But he dwells within us today. And so the last part of this vision deals with a priestly king. We come to understand more about Christ. Not only does he dwell within us, we understand some other things about him. I'll start reading verse 8. Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed, they are men who are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. So God grabs the attention of Joshua and he says, now listen, you need to understand this. You and your friends who are sitting in front of you, again, Joshua is the high priest. And who sits in front of the high priest, but the priests who serve under him. Those are the ones who serve under him. Collectively, together, they are a wondrous sign. And a wondrous sign is speaking of a work that God does in the hearts and the mind of Jewish people. In the same way that priests sit faithfully under their high priest, so also the people of Israel will sit faithfully under their Messiah in his millennial reign. That's the first thing we see is all priests who are sitting under the high priest are a picture of what Israel will be like under their Messiah, Jesus, in the millennial reign. And the rest of the passage tells us about Christ himself. And this is the part that gets really exciting for the believer. In the beginning of verse 8, we see that Christ is a servant. Because the Father says, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. Jesus is a servant. We think about what a servant does, and, and we know that Jesus is serving in the place of all of those who would put their trust in him in the Father's system of justice. We know Isaiah 53 fairly well here at this church. We see a picture of Christ's service, even described to Old Testament Israel. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So there's a piercing, there's a crushing, there is a chastening, there are wounds. That is Christ's service. So when we think about Messiah and who he is, we can't lose sight of the fact that he is a servant. But he's also a branch. And among other things that branch relates to in the Old Testament, branch relates to the kingly nature of the one being described. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and prosper and do justice in the land. So this one who is the branch, he is a servant, 
and he is a king. And we understand something else about him, and that we, we see that he has supremacy. This Messiah, as we wonder what he is, we learn that he's a servant, but he also rules with supremacy. And we see that in verse 9. Behold, the stone that I have put before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. So here the father refers to the son as a stone. And if we remember back to our series that Smed taught on Daniel, we think back to chapter 2, we think about how Christ is described as he's going to come in and destroy all of the superpowers of the world. Verse 34 of Daniel chapter 2. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and it crushed them. Daniel is explaining to Nebuchadnezzar the nature of this statue that he saw in his dream. It had different features and different layers in the statue. All of them represented different nations, and Jesus the stone is going to come in and strike them all without any problem. But we notice here that the, the stone actually not only has power to, to strike all of the, the nations of the world, but it also has seven eyes. And this helps us understand the deity of that particular stone. It has seven eyes. Revelation 5 helps us understand a little bit more about that and about Jesus' possession of something else that has seven features to it. Revelation 5, 6, and then I saw in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the lamb himself in Revelation 5, 6 possesses seven horns and he possesses seven eyes. And those seven eyes are described as the seven spirits of God. So if he possesses the seven spirits of God, he himself is God. That's what we need to remember about all of this. And all of this is describing Messiah Jesus and his place in the millennial kingdom that he actually is going to be there as God. But at the end of verse 9, we see that he's not only going to be there as supreme, he's also going to be there as a savior. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, on the stone declares Yahweh of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. The father will write an inscription on the stone. And that inscription is describing all that is possessed by that stone. All those who are chosen by the Father for eternal life in him. And the proof of this is the effect that it has on the people. And we see that in verse 10. In that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, every one of you will call for his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. What we want to understand here is the setting that's essential for people to do this. Prior to Christ establishing his millennial reign on this earth, when you read Revelation, in the middle chapters of Revelation, you see an extreme destruction that is on the earth. You see that big portions of the earth are destroyed with fire. You see there's darkness. You see that the oceans become like blood. The earth is scarred and it is destroyed and it is ruined in preparation for Christ's millennial kingdom. But what this tells us is that there is going to be a renewal of the earth. Neighbors are going to sit under their vine and their fig tree. It is going to be fruitful and is going to be pleasant. But also, there will be peace. The neighbor will call for his neighbor. People distributed across the land will come together in fellowship and in unity, and they will sit under this vine and under their fig trees. Ezekiel describes this in chapter 36, in verses 8 and 9, when he says, But you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches, and you will bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you will be cultivated and sown. So there's a summary here for this fourth vision, and that is that Satan is accusing, and yet Christ is interceding on behalf of his own, and he's interceding on behalf of the work that he will do to cleanse them. There is a privilege for the priest in this age, who is faithful in this age, that is coming in the next age. We have that same access that the priest will have. We have that access today. And Jesus Christ is the great high priest. He is the one who is a savior. He is the one who is supreme in his authority. He is the one who is a servant over all things. And we have that Messiah here as our Lord and our savior today. So I have two points of, of application for us that are important for us to think about as we think about this vision. And the first one is, what is our response when Satan tempts us to despair over our sin? What is our response to that? 
it is imperative that our first response to that is to remember the forgiveness that has been secured by us, by Christ for us. And then we need to purpose by God's grace to walk in the newness of life that we have because of that grace. So think carefully about how we respond when Satan tempts us to despair over our sin. And the second point of application is, what is our reverence for Christ today? When we read a book like Zechariah, we see all of these grand ideas about Christ and who he is. If he has taken up residence in your heart today, what kind of residence does your esteem for him give him in your heart? Is your heart a place where he would love to dwell and function? Uh, do you maintain a lifestyle in which you are keeping close track of your sin, turning from sin quickly so that your Savior who dwells within you will have every opportunity to enjoy close, sweet fellowship with you? Let's pray. Father, I praise you for these two wonderful visions. I praise you, Lord, that you have sent your Son into this world. You sent him into this world to take on human flesh and to go to a cross where he would represent all of those who would have their faith and their trust in him. I thank you for the finished work that he performed on that cross. I thank you that he is coming again. He is coming again to rule and reign on this earth. Lord, I pray that as we think carefully about who you are and what you have done, that we will eagerly anticipate and desire and yearn for the day when we will have personal, physical fellowship with your son. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.